thanks for coming along to this session. I know it's been already two, if not three days of full-on learning, so thanks for sticking with me and coming along. Um, so my name, for those of you who haven't met me, is Grace Jansen, and I'm a developer advocate at IBM. Um, I work primarily with sort of cloud-native technologies, often open source. Uh, before I was a Java developer, uh, I was a biologist. So that was a fun little career change for me. Um, so I like to sort of bring in other perspectives when I can to my presentations. Unfortunately, the guys who were presenting this, who submitted it originally, aren't able to travel here. So I am giving this presentation. Um, so if there's any questions I might not know the exact answer to uh, at the end of the session when I ask for questions, please do bear with me, but I can get you their contact details and we can find out the answer uh, at the end if you have any questions, I don't know. So without further ado, I'm gonna dive into this session where we're gonna take a look at sort of building effective developer tools, using effective developer tools for Java EE and microprofile applications and developers who use these tools. As I mentioned, I work on a lot of cloud native technologies. My t-shirt's kind of hidden by the booth, but you all have seen a lot of people wearing this t-shirt in the conference. I work, for, I work on a project called Open Liberty, which is a cloud native runtime, which um, is an implementation of both MicroProfile and Jakarta EE. Uh, so it's what we use for a lot of the demo and the one that we use today in this, in this presentation. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about Open Liberty, you can either come and speak to us on the booth. We've got a booth downstairs in the exhibition hall. Come and play our Rover game. I challenge you to beat my score. Uh, or just come and speak to me afterwards or reach out to us um, or check out the website. So why do we even care about sort of making our lives easier when it comes to utilizing these tools? Well, both MicroProfile and Jakarta EE are fantastic open source tools that allow us to take advantage of the latest innovations within Java um, and really allow us to develop effective cloud-native microservices-based uh, applications. So with MicroProfile, we get all of these fantastic goodness, um, and that includes sort of right at the core level all the way through to how we integrate with other microservices and other services and sort of integrate within the cloud, and then observability. So when we've deployed our application into the wild, how do we know it's working as we intended it to? How do we monitor it? How do we check for potential faults, bottlenecks, failures, et cetera? So all of this is stuff that we can get from MicroProfile. Um, and of course, there's also Jakarta EE. A lot of the micro, well, several of the MicroProfile APIs that you saw in the diagram before are shared with Jakarta EE. They're actually implementations. Uh, and again, we get tons of amazing APIs and specifications uh, through Jakarta EE. Anything you can see within each of the core profile, web profile, and platform as well. So we want to be able to take best advantage of this, and we're developing our applications. You know, we're at EclipseCon. A lot of us will already be fans of these projects. So how do we go about actually building applications that are utilizing these technologies and do that in a way that's much easier for us as developers and much more effective? So for that, we need to take a look at, essentially, what is the journey of a cloud-native open source Java developer? What is the process that they're going to go through? And what are the tools that we can use at each stage of that process to help make our lives easier? So the first thing we're probably going to do is if we don't have a project already, we need to create a new project. Um, and so we might be sort of creating it from scratch, or we might be basing it off uh, an application that we have already. Once we have that project sort of set up in some way or another, we're probably going to be either adding classes, adding features, adding code, or editing the existing code that we might have in some way. So we've got some kind of iterative process there around adding and editing code. The next thing is once we have the basics of an application, we're going to be wanting to build, run, uh, and potentially deploy our application. So we're going to be looking at sort of packaging tools, build tools, deployment tools, and then because we're all excellent developers, we're going to be testing because all good developers need to test their applications. And so then we're going to be writing some tests for our code, testing it, um, and essentially repeating this process over and over again to make sure our application is as effective as possible. And throughout this process, we're going to be probably choosing an IDE of our choice. 
Uh, we are developers, we have strong opinions, and I love it. So we're all probably gonna have one particular ID that we love more than others. And that's fine, and that's what you can use, and that's the great part about a lot of this open source is that it integrates with different types of IDEs no matter your particular preference. And the nice thing about all of this is that throughout this process, we're also probably gonna want some kind of coding assistance uh, when we do need it. Um, we're all fantastic developers, I'm sure, but sometimes a little bit of help can be nice. Uh, so sometimes it can be nice even just to make it more effective and efficient in terms of minimizing the code that we actually have to manually write. Um, so having that coding assistance can be really Really helpful. So looking at this in sort of a model diagram, I've made this quite simple. There are some more complex models you can take a look at that reflect the same thing. But essentially what we're going through here is this iterative circle of creating code, editing, building it, editing again, testing, and going round and round in this circle. And as I mentioned, uh, we'll usually have some kind of IDE or editor that allows us to do this. So utilizing this model, I'm breaking it down into each step to analyze, okay, at each step, how can I utilize developer tools to make this easier and more effective? So the first of those was the create stage. So if, for example, you don't yet have an application or you want to get started, for example, with a particular runtime or a particular project, starters can be a fantastic place to start at, hence the name. Uh, so you can utilize starter projects, really starter projects, to make this a really simple and easy process to get started with a basic application. So the MicroProfile Starter is a fantastic example of this, and the great thing about the MicroProfile Starter is that it actually has, um, it's available as extensions in VS Code and IntelliJ. So if those are your IDE of choice, you can literally just install the extension, and that allows you to do it within the IDE. Otherwise, you can visit the MicroProfile.io website and do it via the website, and literally it's just drop-down menus. So you select things like uh, what runtime do you want to use, um, like where, what artifact name do you want to give it, like all of these different uh, variables that you plug in to their, essentially what is either drop downs or text boxes, and then at the end of it, it will essentially give you a zip file that has included in it a very basic application based on your preferences. Other starter projects that you can utilize include things like the Jakarta EE starter project, which you can access through the website here, or you can use runtime specific starter project if you know already what runtime you want to use. So the one for Open Liberty is at start.openliberty.io, but there are also lots of other open source runtimes that have starter projects like Quarkus and Pyara as alternatives. So starters can be a great place, as the name suggests, to start off when it comes to creating that initial application. When it comes to building, um, next, obviously, once we've got the basic application, we want to try and build it. Uh, so in the Java space, some of the most common build tools are either Maven or Gradle. Uh, and there are, luckily, lots of plugins that are available to help with the build lifecycle or the DevOps process. You could use any of the Liberty, Maven, or Gradle uh, plugins as an example. Many of the runtimes have these, have these plugins. Uh, so for example, we have the Liberty Maven plugin, so you can see a couple of commands there that we have uh, for that particular plugin, like Maven Liberty Dev, or Maven Liberty Dev C if you're using containers. Another thing that you can make use of is also um, dev mode. So has anyone heard of dev mode before? Yeah, got some hands, great. Got fans already, excellent. Um, so for those of you who haven't come across dev mode, you might have heard of something like hot reload in uh, products like Quarkus, for example. This really is all about as developers, it can be really frustrating when you make a code change and it takes flipping ages to tear down your application, redeploy it, check what the changes you made are and what effects they've had. So this really allows you to see those changes iteratively and really fast and responsive. Um, so essentially what happens is it, it tracks changes to your class files. When you save them, it automatically redeploys those particular any classes or configuration files you've changed. So you don't have to tear down your application manually and redeploy it. So it means you can iteratively see changes really quickly. And that can be really helpful when you're making just small iterative changes in a very agile manner and seeing those in real time. Uh, so this is like sort of an automation step that we can take to, again, be more productive with our time instead of wasting time waiting to tear down and start up again. On the editing side, uh, so things like, as I mentioned, IDE or editor integration. 
So being able to integrate not just with microprofile and CAR-T eAPIs, but also with runtime specific integrations or extensions as well. Um, there are, again, very helpfully, lots of plugins that we can use for this. Um, for the cloud native APIs like MicroProfile and Jakarta E, but also specifically for the runtimes. So this screenshot is an example of the Visio, Visual Studio Code Marketplace. So if you type in their MicroProfile, you'll see the, there's actually lots of MicroProfile specific plugins that you can use, but also some of the runtimes like Quarkus and Open Liberty. Um, and this really allows us to have that integration for things like runtime lifecycle management, um, having these custom plugins so that it can suggest um, code completion, for example, uh, and just basically make our lives a lot more effective when it comes to developing in an IDE. And as I said, there's not, it's not just Visual Studio Code. There are other plugins that you can use, for example, like Eclipse um, or for things like uh, IntelliJ as well. Uh, there's also in the editing stage this coding assistance that I sort of briefly mentioned about, you know, we want help when we're developing in the IDEs to use these APIs, whether it's just like we've made a mistake, uh, it might be unintentionally, or whether it's just we want some quick help to work out uh, what's going on and what's needed so we don't necessarily have to type manually as much, um, so sort of using code completion. And the community has been working really hard on things like language servers for this to be able to enable these kind of things in a really like common shared fashion to enable developers to work with things like microprofile and Jakarta EE APIs really easily. So one example for, for uh, as an example is the language server for Eclipse microprofile. Uh, so this is an incubator project at the Eclipse Foundation. So go and check this out if you've not seen it before. Um, and it has VS Code extensions, and there are and this is a tool that was originally done uh, for microprofile from Red Hat. If you do want to contribute to it, we, we would welcome contributions. This is still an active project that's being worked on, so you can head on over to the GitHub uh, repo that I put there if you want to take a look. But essentially what this enables is all the things I mentioned. Help when it comes to you've made a mistake using some kind of microprofile API, or uh, things like code completion if you're using microprofile APIs as well. Um, other ones I include things like the language server for Jakarta EE. Again, this is another incubator project under the Eclipse Foundation. A very similar effort, but this time providing that language server support for specifically Jakarta EE APIs. Um, and the great thing about this is that it can be plugged into different editors to help offer sort of that standardized format, uh, whether it be focusing on diagnostics or quick fixes or co-completions or anything like that. Um, actually, the exciting thing is that we've, are now, we've been able to include this very recently within the last like, few days into our latest release of uh, Liberty Tools for Eclipse. So if you are interested, we literally released it on Friday, um, and you can check out this project, which is included as part of it, um, or let me know if we have a demo so I can show you that as well at some point. Now, also in the edit section, uh, we can't really not talk about code generators as well in this section. Um, so there are many different additional tools that can help with generating sort of boilerplate code um, or templates. So for example, many of these come under sort of the open API tools, and they, help, they can help generate things like microprofile REST client template interfaces. Um, and these can be either part of the CLI or of the tools or as a VS Code extension. So it depends on which one you'd rather. Um, there's also things like, for example, JAXRS stubs generation, again, in the open API tools. Um, and all of this, that's using uh, JAXRS2. And all of this is really designed to help us reduce the amount of time we spend coding manually and help us to avoid making costly mistakes. Um, and all of these tools can sort of help check our code, help suggest code, um, and really make it easier for us to go through this editing um, and writing code stage. And as I mentioned, like all great developers, because we are fabulous developers, we of course want to test. Um, now, whether it be sort of you're testing up front or you're testing later, testing is an integral part of the development process. So it's really important that we utilize effective tools when it comes to this. Now, of course, there are the usual suspects, like for example, JUnit tests or Arquillion, but there's also some new guys on the block, which can be really interesting if you're using uh, things like containerization. Uh, so things like test containers or microshed testing, which is an implementation of test containers. These essentially leverage containers to not only make it easier for you as a developer to write tests, but I would argue more importantly, getting that dev prod parity. So making your development environment as close to production as possible. 
If you're deploying your application into a container, it makes sense to then test in a container to try and mimic that environment as closely as possible. And so in order to do that on your local machine, you can use things like test containers, which can essentially pull in containers for additional third-party services like databases, for example, Kafka, et cetera, to be able to mimic that production environment. Uh, so if you are interested in that, we actually have a couple of tutorials and demos, and I can point you to those afterwards if you want to check out how you use test containers. But they can be some really useful tools when it comes to trying to automate our testing and make it as effective as possible. And of course, we can't ignore developer resources. As much as we might be using all of these tools, there will come a time when we come across, say, a new feature we want to make use of. Maybe there's an API within MicroProfile or Jakarta EE that we haven't made use of yet, but that we want to in the future. And it can be really helpful to go to documentation, interactive guides, labs, tutorials, to refer back to, to really get hands-on and understand each of these particular, say, technologies we're not familiar with. So some of the most useful ones that I've come across are things like extensions for Micro Profile, uh, the Eclipse Cargo Tracker app, which can be a really great reference implementation for Jakarta EE, sort of give the blueprints for that. And then ones that I would definitely recommend, uh, which I help to work on, are things like the Open Liberty Guides. So the great thing about those is that we've worked really, really hard with the internal teams to develop an online environment. So essentially, you don't have to have any prerequisites downloaded locally to be able to get in and get hands-on with this technology. We have an online IDE, um, essentially a complete environment. So you're kind of learning cloud technologies and cloud APIs literally in the cloud, which is quite fun. It's like a little like inception cloud thing. Uh, so that's quite a fun one to do. And yeah, if you're interested in any of the MicroProfile and Jakarta EE APIs, they, we have guides on pretty much all of them on our Open Liberty website, and most of them can be done in our cloud native environment. So definitely check that out if you are interested. So uh, I'm going to do the summary of the tools. How long have I got left? I've still got time. Perfect. So summary of the tools here that I've sort of whizzed through. Um, so when it comes to starters, I've got some common tools there for MicroProfile and Jakarta EE in the first two columns, and then runtime specific, this time for Open Liberty. But as I said, there's lots of other runtimes that you can make use of, like Quarkus, Pyara, et cetera, that have their own tools that you can make use of. So looking at the starter projects, uh, looking at build and run using things like the Maven and Gradle plugins, using things like dev mode or hot reload, whatever you're using, um, IDE integration, so really integrating effectively using things like the language server support um, or runtime specific support as well. Uh, things like Liberty Tools, as I mentioned, can be a great way of sort of combining it all. So that's our runtime specific IDE integration, which enables you to make use of the language servers too and then code generators and automated testing. Now, I have time for my demo, which has been pre-recorded. Um, so I'm going to try and, what are you guys seeing? You're still seeing that. All right. Let me end my show. This is where I'm going to regret saying no to mirroring, isn't it? Um, and then, can I drag it over? There it is. All right. So we, can you see that? Yeah, excellent. Perfect. Right. It's, up. it's pretty much there. Okay, now I'm going to have to work out where my mouse is. There we go. I'm going to change the speed because I had made this like 1.5. I'm going to make a 1 because we have time to do this demo. Okay, so this is essentially a demo using what is um, sort of a preview of our latest Liberty tools. Um, and so this will hopefully show you essentially um, we're using it in the Eclipse IDE. Uh, so for those of you who use Eclipse IDE as your IDE of choice, this will be essentially what you would be using. Um, so in this, what we're doing is we are generating, is it playing? Yeah? Cool. So we are essentially selecting the options we want using the Open Liberty Starter project. Um, so this is what we're doing to essentially show how you can get started really easily using one of the starter projects. But you can use either the Micro Profile or a Runtime Specific or Jakarta E Starter Kit. Um, so we're just going to choose some of these preferences, but you can choose what you like. And then we're going to show that basically we're using the Liberty tools for Eclipse. Uh, so we've got the language support in there for Micro Profile uh, and the Jakarta E APIs, as well as the Liberty config language server as well. Um, so I hope you guys are seeing that. Yeah. Perfect. And then what we're going to use after this bit, let it run. 
Um, and then what we're going to use is the Liberty dashboard to essentially start dev mode on the project. Uh, so this is where we require the Liberty Maven plugin uh, in the pom.xml. I'm going to have to move, otherwise you're never going never gonna to see it. All right. So here you go, showing in our pom.xml about the fact that we're using Jakarta EE. We're also using MicroProfile, for example. Um, and there's our Liberty Maven plugin that I mentioned we need to have. Cool. And then the next part is, we should be hovering over them in our server.xml. Yeah, so we're just gonna head over to our server.xml to show that we've also got things like MicroProfile, OpenAPI, JSONB, JSONP, uh, so the different features that we're making use of within this application. Uh, so hopefully now we're gonna build out, oh yeah, she's just showing you there that we're, you, if you hover over them, you're, because we're using the, the Liberty Config language server, uh, you should be able to see extra information about it. And now in our terminal down the bottom, we're essentially building our application. There we go. Um, and now we're gonna create a MicroProfile health readiness check. So we're gonna use the snippet for the langu language server for MicroProfile to build the class. Uh, so that's what you're seeing here. Um, and then we're gonna add the MicroProfile health feature to the server.xml and show the feature completion coming from the Liberty Config language server. So essentially this is where we're showing that you can use essentially code completion instead of having to do it all yourself to be able to implement that, um, making it a bit easier when you're developing. There we go. So you can see that was pretty quick. Uh, would have taken a lot longer to write that ourselves. Uh, and then after that, cool. Yeah, source compilation was successful. So again, we're using dev mode to essentially pick up any changes that we're making in our class. Now we're using the uh, Jakarta EE. We're showing a snippet completion for Jakarta EE. So we're adding a method for JAXRS. Again, this is using the language server for Jakarta EE that I mentioned. So LSP for Jakarta EE. Um, and again, it's just super quick to be able to actually create classes that we need. Um, and then, again, it should have, yeah, our source compilation was successful. So again, it's hot reloading as we go. Um, and then after that, yeah, we're gonna do some testing. So we're gonna run some tests. And because we're using dev mode, it's automatically picking them up. Cool. There you go, you can see we're using that URL. Cool. Yeah, okay, so we're basically showing that we're connecting the application to the Eclipse debugger. We're using dev mode, which is exposing the port by default. Uh, so we should be able to use this debugger now and then essentially see what our application is doing. So this is, I think, where she's creating some, can't quite see it. Cool, so this is the Jakarta one where we're essentially using the Jakarta EE language server. So just let's run for a little bit. Okay, so I think I was a bit ahead with my instructions there. But essentially, you kind of get the idea of, we're using language service in this, in this demo application, using the Open Liberty or Liberty developer tools to be able to make use of that. So I'm just gonna, I don't know how I stop this now. Is it stopped? I can't see. Okay, I'll just let it keep running. You can watch it if you're interested. Otherwise, you are free to ask questions. Um, I've got some links if you want links to sort of where you can find each of these tools uh, if you're interested. Let's see if this works. No, okay, because I'm playing that, right. Presenter view? 
Yeah, there we go. Okay. So if you do want to check out any of these projects, then do head to the following links. I can share these slides online if you don't want to take a picture and type it in yourself, I understand. Um, but essentially, hopefully, I've shown you that you know, utilizing developer tools can make for effective development, whether that's correcting mistakes that you might have made unintentionally, or whether it's um, making it more effective in terms of code completion uh, and creating new classes and utilizing these great open source cloud native APIs. Um, I finished a little bit early, I apologize, but does anyone have any questions? Yeah. You showed this uh, beautiful table. Yes. And, uh, that one? Um, good question. Don't know. I'll fix it. I'll add it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I'll add that in. Thanks. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Yep. Still possible. So the way that we do it in Open Liberty is when you set dev mode running, uh, just like in Quarkus, it will listen for any code changes. In terms of actually running your tests, all you need to do is go into the terminal where you've run dev mode and hit enter, and it will automatically run your tests again. So you can keep running them for as long as you want. As long as that dev mode's still running, um, you can make all the code changes you want and keep running your tests. You just The reason we didn't do it when you hit save is just because we don't always want to test when we hit save. Uh, so really it was just to give control to you, but still to make it as easy as possible, um, it's just enter. Yep, great question, thanks. For anyone who's listening, I've realized I haven't repeated it. It was how do we test uh, when we're doing dev mode? Thanks for the question. Uh, any other questions on some of the tools that I've shown or anything? Nope. Cool. Um, if you are interested in finding out more about things like the language servers, uh, then feel free to reach out to me on Twitter and I can point you in the direction of some of the team who helped to work on that from IBM. If any of you were in my earlier talk around Canosp uh, and the Canadian open source project that we have with the Canadian universities, we've actually got a lot of students involved in those language server projects. Um, so we are always welcoming new people to contribute to that uh, and there's some more information about the language servers in that presentation as well. Um, otherwise, I can, as I said, just point you in the right direction of the people who are who are experts in this. Cool. Well, thanks so much for spending the time to come to this session. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys.